Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. This beautiful summer day. As you can tell, the carpet renovation installation is in progress. And it should be completed this week. I want to thank Deb Liddell, Karen and Dave for helping us get this back together for worship service today so we don't, didn't get interrupted. The Hilltown Cooperative Ministries is currently planning a potluck and hymn sing on September 23rd from 1 to 3 at Jerusalem. So uh, mark your calendars. Future details will be forthcoming. And please take a look at your bulletin for additional announcements and upcoming events, and especially the prayer list, because it is long. Do we have any other announcements? Yes, Walter. Only because my voice doesn't care. Margaret Cook thanks everybody. Her birthday was July. And Sandy made, Sandy made beautiful cake, cakes for her. And uh, Margaret uh, handshakes, so she can't write thank you note. And she asked me this morning if I could thank everybody for eating the cake and celebrating her birthday. Thank you, all. Any other announcements? Well, let us go to prayer concerns. Oh, I'm sorry, Diane. It's okay. I overlooked you. <laughs> it's okay. I just wanted to say, um, we belong to New Salem Fire Department, and one of our members, not an old member, had a heart attack and suddenly died on August 1st, and all his um, family's services and all are today and tomorrow, and we could just keep that family. She came home and found him on the floor dead from a massive heart attack. Thompson, Kelly Thompson is the last. The Thompson family, and with that, Please keep the family of Mimi Halk and Julia Peck in your prayers as they passed away. Both ladies passed away this week. And Rusty, thank you for your help with the church. <laughs> you thanked everybody else. So, so this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Gracious God. We gather once again to offer you praise and thanksgiving for your unfailing love and faithfulness, shown most clearly through your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant us grace to worship you in spirit and in truth. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, open our eyes to recognize you in your moments. Give us courage to step out in faith to meet you and confidence to follow where you lead. For you are our God, and we are your people, called by your name. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, amen. Please join me in our call to worship found in your bulletin. Come, children of God, and be welcomed here as you are. We gather in this place to worship God and God alone. Come, children of God, and be fed at the Lord's table. We come to receive what we need for the journey ahead. Come, children of God, and let us find the fuel for our faith. We come to the table to receive God's blessing and share it with others. Come, let us worship God. Our hymn is number 321, according to thy gracious word.
Jesus said, those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will save it. Friends, the invitation to the Lord's table is larger than any of us could ever imagine. Let us confess the ways in which we have sought to limit that invitation. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, we admit before God and one another our faults and our failings. Please join me in our prayer confession found in your bowl. God of hospitality and wonder, you welcome us to the table and invite those who are different than us. This invitation has made us uncomfortable, unsettled, and defensive. Our discomfort comes from an unwillingness to see other people's perspectives. Our unsettledness comes from a dependence on the status quo. Our defensiveness comes from the belief that our image of you is the only one that matters. Help us to surrender ourselves to the abundance of your invitation. Inspire us to embrace the fact that diversity is strength, not weakness. Gather us to love the stranger, care for the oppressed, and feed the hungry. Forgive us for our short sightedness and open us to your gospel that we might be better embody the love of community. You call us to be. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Whether we hear a voice from the heavens or a small, still voice in our hearts, listen carefully for the love of God. Believe and accept God's love and live in God's freedom. Our God is a God of grace and mercy and love. Know that in Jesus Christ, our sins have been forgiven. May we be strengthened in all goodness. Since we have been raised with Christ, let us seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of the Father. Thanks be to God, we are saved. Amen. And knowing this, how are we then to live? Our Lord said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments stand all the law and the prophets. Amen.
Let us go back to the Lord and confess what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he arose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Lord.
for those in our hearts and in our minds. We've lifted these names up to you today, to the families who need prayers, to the people on our prayers. To you, they are much more than names. They are your precious children. They are parents and sisters and brothers and children and bosses and employees, aunts and uncles. They are yours. You know every detail of their lives far better than we do. You know their needs. Lord, we can trust you with all our prayers. Not only because we know you have the power to answer, but because you have sent, seen that you are faithful and just. The promises we claim today are the same as those your people have claimed across the generations. Through your Son, you have redeemed your people. You bring beauty and good from what we in our brokenness and ignorance have it intended for evil. And in time, you will redeem the world, bringing an end to death and the beginning of an eternity of worship when every tribe, tongue, and nation will sing songs of praise. Until then, we wait. Help us not to spend our days looking up at the sky. Send your Spirit that we might see the world as you do. Fill us with your compassion for those in need. Of shelter, of a friend, or of an advocate. Send us the brokenhearted, the discarded, and those who are hungry for the transformation only you can bring. While our hearts cry, come Lord Jesus, let our hands reveal your presence in the world we inhabit. We ask these sayings in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In our hymns, number 323, let us break bread together.
Spirit, lift these words from the pages of Scripture like the aroma of freshly baked bread. Help us to hunger for these words, to be fed by your grace, and to share what you offer with all of your children on this earth. Amen. Our scripture today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. This happens after John the Baptist had been executed. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away, so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up into heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. All those who ate were about five thousand men, besides the women and the children. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We've all heard it numerous times in our lives, or perhaps said it ourselves on occasion. Excuses, excuses. It could be our workout day, and we are sick and just don't feel like it. Excuses, excuses, says the personal trainer. Or maybe we know we shouldn't have the dessert in the restaurant, but we just can't pass up the opportunity to try the new house special. More excuses, excuses. We could be trying to get our kids to clean up the room and then suddenly decide they just decide they need to go to the bathroom or get a drink of water or check their email. More excuses. We say it with exasperation. The list goes on and on. Quite simply, if there is something we don't want to do, we can usually come up with some at least semi-valid excuse not to do it. And we usually do. Then again, sometimes instead of giving an excuse not to do something, we just suck it up and do it anyway. The scripture passage we just heard a few moments ago is full of opportunities to make excuses. And sometimes excuses were offered, and sometimes not. Matthew's telling of the feeding of the 5,000 immediately follows the news of John the Baptist's behavior. Upon learning of his violent death, Jesus and his disciples withdrew to a solitary place. They were hoping to get away for a while, hoping for some peace and quiet to sort through their pain and sorrow. This was Jesus' cousin after all, not to mention a fellow prophet and a friend. Understandably, Jesus needs time and space to mourn the loss, to pray to God, and to deal with his feelings of grief. But it was not to be. As Matthew tells us, no sooner had Jesus and the disciples shoved off in their boat than the crowds began appearing on the shore. It would have been more than easy and definitely understandable 
for Jesus to make excuses. Just keep rowing, guys. I need some quiet. My friend has been killed. I need to take a break from the work while we get all this sorted out. He could have even looked over to the crowd and said, I'm sorry, friends, not today. My cousin and colleague have been killed, and I need some time with my friends and my family. And I believe those people would have been understanding. You're right, Jesus. I'm sorry to hear of your loss. We'll be praying for you. Then they would have turned and gone on their way, patiently waiting the time that Jesus was prepared to return to the work of his ministry again. But Jesus didn't make excuses. Even though he was certainly feeling the grief of loss, he didn't keep rowing away from the shore, seeking quiet and solitude. Instead, he turned and he saw the crowds. And Matthew tells us, had compassion on them. Then even though he was hurting himself, even though he was grieving and wanting some peace and quiet, Jesus returned to the shore and healed the sick. But the story doesn't end there. We get the impression that Jesus worked all day, through the afternoon, into the evening, healing people. And before you knew it, it was mealtime. The disciples came to him with an excuse of sorts, an opportunity for a break and some peace and quiet finally. Jesus, they said, it's evening. You have to stop now. These people need to get back home so they can eat. But here again, Jesus responds, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. But Jesus, they said, we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. You can almost imagine Jesus shaking his head. Excuses, excuses. He must have been thinking. But instead he said, bring them here to me. And after he blessed the bread and broke it, the disciples handed out the food, and everyone ate and had their fill with food to spare. The number of those ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children, it could have been 20,000 people. Amazing to think that over 5,000 people ate to fullness with only five loaves of bread and two little fish. Imagine how disappointed those people would have been if Jesus had made excuses and continued on to find a place of solitude. Imagine if Jesus had listened to the excuses of the disciples and sent everyone home. People would not have been healed. People would not have been fed. Miracles would have not happened, much less been witnessed by those great crowds. People would have not have known the love of God and the miracle of God's kingdom at work on earth. And it all could have gone south with just a few excuses. But Jesus didn't make excuses. Jesus makes sacrifices. This is the gospel story at its simplest. God in Christ Jesus loves us unconditionally, even to the point of sacrifice. The feeding of the multitudes is the only miracle story that appears in all four Gospels, precisely because it strikes at the very heart of the Gospel message. It's a story of great power, not simply because of what happens, not because it demonstrates that God is love, it teaches us what it means to follow Christ and it assures us of God's power for good in the world. The key reality in the story of the feeding of the 5,000 is that Jesus had compassion. Despite all the hurdles and difficulties, despite the power stacked against him, and despite his own personal hopes and needs, compassion for people was Jesus' prime motivation. 
He cared about the wholeness and well-being of all people. And Jesus made sacrifices, even the ultimate sacrifice, for the healing of the nations and for the good of every person. Today's question, are we prepared to do that? Or is an excuse all we really have prepared? Aside from the message of God's sacrificial love, an equally important point of this passage is to teach us about discipleship and what it means to be a disciple of Christ, about making sacrifices, not excuses. This is about the church's job in this world. Jesus did not feed the 5,000. He told the disciples to do it. Jesus took what was available, blessed it, and gave it to the disciples and told them to hand it out. To that point, they had just been busy making excuses. It's getting late. The place is deserted. We don't have the money to feed these people. I don't have time to go and get food. It's too long a walk anyway. We only have five loaves of bread and two fish. Now they couldn't make excuses anymore. Jesus is telling them to suck it up and work with what you have. And what Jesus does with what we give him is so mysterious and so powerful that it really can't be described in words. This is where faith comes in. Right when we are thinking of all the excuses we can muster about why we can't do something, God steps in, giving us the power to work for good in the world and then calling us to make some sacrifices and do just that. The question for each of us today as disciples of Jesus Christ, what sacrifices are we willing to make? As we stand on our own hillsides, amidst overwhelming need and seemingly insurmountable obstacles, I ask, what's in our picnic basket? What are we prepared to offer to Christ? For indeed, all of us have something to offer. No excuses. As with the small boy who simply made his supper available, so we can do the same. You see, it's not our ability, but our availability that matters to God. Are we available to reach out to our community for the sake of Christ? Or are we full of excuses? All around us, people who are homeless because of unemployment and foreclosure. Children are suffering because their parents have built up on drugs. People are in agony because of the heat. Cars are not available. Some groceries aren't either. They are those who are ill and have no access to medical or those who are lost and lonely following the loss of a loved one because of a death or a divorce or some other falling out. And there are those whose physical needs are being met, but who are spiritually depleted and don't know where to turn. These are the hungry multitude on our hillside. Are we making ourselves available for them? Or are we making excuses? And like the disciples who wanted to be like Jesus, do we have compassion for their plight? Are we ready to make some sacrifices? To set our own wants aside for their well-being? How much do we care about the people in the community? About the people who do not go to church? and do not have a relationship with God? Do we want to serve God's kingdom? Do we want Christ's church, this church, to grow? Or will we rather make excuses? It was true when Jesus walked with the disciples 2,000 years ago, and it's equally true today. There is no time more urgent 
than the present, to be Christ's hands and feet working in this needy world. And if we are willing to make some sacrifices, if we are willing to take up our cross and follow Christ, then as the Apostle Paul said, Jesus is able to accomplish abundantly more than we all we ask or think. Do we look at the crowds and say, it can't be done? Or do we look at Christ and say with confidence, with God, all things are possible? This story about the feeding of the multitudes reminds us that Jesus wants us to help do God's work in the world. We have to give all we can of ourselves and our resources. We have to have faith that God will take our offerings and bless them abundantly for the good of all. And just as the disciples were Jesus' hands and feet, giving the bread and fish to the 5,000, we, the church of Jesus Christ, are called to be the hands and feet of Christ today. And I pray we may all respond to the needs around us, not with excuses, but with compassionate hearts, offering all we have, offering all we have to Jesus so that he might bless us for us to share with others. Amen. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, we praise and adore you for the empowering us to claim membership of the body of Christ. A gift received through the fullness of your grace. Empower us anew, we pray, with tongues of fire and hearts of love to proclaim the reconciling word among people. Remind us that we are all members of that one body. And if one member suffers, we all suffer. May we, as the body of Christ in this place, be the best evidence of your love by declaring and witnessing to this as the year of the Lord's favor for all people. We give thanks that all of us are Christ's body and rejoice in each one of us being a part of it. Accept our adoration and praise for these great gifts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And we now come to a time of communion with our Lord. Beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Supper, which we are about to celebrate, is a feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. We come in remembrance that our Lord Jesus Christ was sent of the Father into the world to assume our flesh and blood and to fulfill for us all obedience to the divine law, even to the bitter and shameful death on the cross. By his death, resurrection, and ascension, he extends a new and eternal covenant of grace and reconciliation that we might be accepted in God and never be forsaken by him. We come to have communion with the same Christ who has promised to be with us always, even to the end of the world. In the breaking of the bread, he makes himself known to us as the true heavenly bread that strengthens us into eternal life. In the cup of blessing, he comes to us as divine, in whom we must abide if we are to bear fruit. We come in hope, believing that this bread and this cup are a pledge and a foretaste of the feet of love of which we shall partake when his kingdom has fully come. When with unveiled face we shall behold him, made like unto him in his glory, since by his death, resurrection, and ascension, Christ has obtained for us the life-giving spirit who unites us all in one body. 
so are we to receive this supper in true love, mindful of the communion of saints. All baptized Christians present are welcome to the Lord's table. Come now, as all things are ready. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks to bring you. Holy and right it is, and our joyful duty to give thanks to you at all times and all places, O Lord our Creator, Almighty and everlasting God. You created heaven with all its hosts, and the earth with all its plenty. You have given us life and being, and preserved us by your providence. But you have shown us the fullness of your love in sending into the world your Son, Jesus Christ, the eternal word made flesh for us and for our salvation. For the precious gift of this mighty Savior who has reconciled us to you, we praise and bless you, O God. With your whole church on earth and with all the company of heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, God, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Most righteous God, we remember in this supper the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. In the joy of his resurrection and in the expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you is holy and living sacrifices. Together, we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, that the bread which we break and the cup which we bless may be to us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Grant that being joined together in Him, we may obtain to the unity of the faith and grow up in all things into Christ our Lord. And as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O oh Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus, the night he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. Take the In the same manner as he had broke the bread, he took the cup when they had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. Take and drink. Brothers and sisters, since the Lord has now fed us in this table, let us praise God's holy name with heartfelt thanksgiving. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do for not forget all His benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals you of all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. As a father has compassion for his children, 
who did not spare his only son, but gave him up for us all, and will also give us all things with him. Therefore shall my mouth and my heart show forth praise of the Lord from this time forth forevermore. Amen. And we can now approach God with our generosity and our thanks as we give our tithes and offerings. 